Okay. All right, yes, I'm, I'm going to disappear. So stay in touch, my friend, okay? I will. Thanks, Jeff. Be safe. Thank you, you too. So we'll just give it a minute for folks to file in and I'll make a couple of quick announcements and, and then we can get started. You guys able to see my little pointer here on the screen? Yes. Okay, folks are still filing in, but I'll just go ahead and start. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Rachel Hasna, and I am with uh, UNM's Division for Community Behavioral Health. Welcome to our Law and Mental Health Didactic. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements uh, regarding our CEU process. Um, oh, okay. Uh, the CEU process. So in the last five minutes of the lecture, I will be submitting um, an evaluation link in the chat. If you just uh, toggle your mouse to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a menu. You can click on the chat icon and then that will bring up the chat box, which should have the evaluation link in it. Fill out the evaluation and a certificate of completion will be automatically generated for you. It's your responsibility to save it. If you're on your smartphone, you'll wanna take a screenshot. If you're joining from your computer or your laptop, you'll wanna save it as a Word or a PDF, whatever works for you. If you're joining us by phone and listening and you need um, the evaluation link to be emailed, just send me an email and I'm happy to, to get that information to you. Um, we should have C C CMEs by the beginning of May. Um, it's a bit of a bureaucratic process. So uh, just thanks for hanging tight with those folks. And um, that's about it. So I'll hand it over to Julie. Thank you, Rachel. Um, welcome everyone to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. This series is hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. Uh, we're so glad to have you all here joining us today. My name is Julie Brovko. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. So first I wanna remind you to join us next week at that time, we have Drs. Elizabeth Foster and Sharon Kelly, who are presenting Feedback in Forensic Mental Health Assessment, Ethical Guidance and Suggestions for Practice. Now, for our talk today, please ask your questions in the Q&A anytime you feel comfortable. Just know we're probably not going to get to them until the end. As always, we try to get to as many of your questions as possible, um, but please forgive us or ask me your forgiveness ahead of time if we can't get to yours. Now, for those of you who want CUs but are um, on a tight schedule, you do have to stay for that full hour, but you don't have to stay longer than that. So I'll try and let you know when um, the talk is officially over, but just know we will probably be staying on longer to address your questions. Um, all right, uh, now it's time for what we've all been waiting for. I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Ben Pora. Uh, Dr. Ben Porath is a professor of psychological sciences at Kent State University. He did his doctoral training at the University of Minnesota and has been involved extensively in MMPI research for the last 35 years. He is a co-developer of the MMPI-3, the MMPI-2RF, and MMPI-ARF, and co-author of test manuals, books, uh, book chapters, and articles on the MMPI instruments. He's a board certified psychologist by the American Board of Professional Psychology and Clinical Psychology. His clinical practice involves supervision of assessments at Kent State Psychological Clinic, consultation to agencies that screen candidates for public safety positions, and provision of consultation and expert witness services in forensic cases. I'm Dr. Ben Porath. We're so grateful to have you here today and for your time and expertise. On behalf of the University of New Mexico, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for presenting. I'm now gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Bravko, and thank you all for uh, inviting me to present today and uh, for everyone attending uh, this presentation. Uh, before uh, turning to the presentation itself, I would like to offer a disclosure of my financial uh, interest in the uh, uh, instrument that we're discussing today. I am a paid consultant to the MMPI publisher, the University of Minnesota Press, uh, and distributor Pearson. I receive research funding from the University of Minnesota Press and as co-author of the MMPI 2RF and MMPI 3, I receive royalties 
on sales of test materials and uh, scorings. Um, uh, this disclaimer here was uh, put into the uh, slide deck, so I want to make sure that you're aware that uh, the views expressed in the presentation are those of uh, myself, the speaker, and do not necessarily represent the views, policies, and positions of the University of New Mexico. Uh, in terms of our learning objectives for today's uh, presentation, at the end of the presentation, uh, you uh, uh, should be able to describe the rationale for developing uh, the MMPI-3, identify the research base for forensic use of the uh, MMPI-3, uh, and discuss uh, potential challenges to forensic use of the um, uh, MMPI-3. And that, of course, uh, ties uh, very closely to our agenda for today's uh, presentation. I'm going to begin with a, a general introduction of the uh, MMPI-3. It's obviously going to be relatively brief and more of, a, uh, of an overview. I'll be talking a little bit about the, um, uh, the uh, uh, historical context of the MMPI-3, so putting the um, MMPI-3 in the context of uh, the evolution of the MMPI uh, instruments, uh, then talk a little bit about some of the preliminary studies that were done prior to development of the MMPI-3, and then uh, go over the development plan and, and process, talk about the outcome of the uh, development in terms of the uh, uh, MMPI-3 scales, and importantly, the norms, uh, the new norms for the um, MMPI-3. And then also briefly uh, mention some of the resources that are available to guide MMPI-3 use uh, and uh, the literature, the research literature that can be applied to the MMPI-3, including in forensic uh, um, assessments. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit about uh, forensic um, applications uh, of the uh, test and, and in particular address uh, potential challenges to uh, uh, MMPI-3 based uh, testimony. Uh, and the fa the, uh, this has to do with the fact that anytime a new version of the test is uh, introduced, that of course uh, does uh, uh, bring with it some uh, potential challenges in particular to forensic uh, practitioners in the adversarial uh, system. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then, um, as Dr. Bravko mentioned, I'll uh, leave some time um, before the end of the hour for uh, Q&A, and if need be, and if people are interested, I'm happy to stay a little bit uh, past uh, the top of the hour for uh, any additional uh, questions. Uh, if you do have questions along the way, do feel free to type them into the, uh, the chat, uh, but uh, I, I'm not monitoring the chat, so we won't be able to get to any of your uh, questions until um, the end of the presentation, just uh, FYI. Okay, a uh, little bit of MMPI uh, history. I'm sure uh, many of you are uh, familiar with this, but I think it is important to uh, put the MMPI-3 in this um, context. The test was originally published in 1943. The authors of the original MMPI were Stark Hathaway, a psychologist, and Charlie McKinley, a psychiatrist. Um, McKinley was actually the chair of the neuropsychiatry uh, department uh, in the university uh, at the University of Minnesota Hospital and Hathaway was a relatively new staff psychologist, uh, both new to the staff and also a, a relatively new uh, uh, creature, so to speak, a psychologist on the staff of a psychiatry uh, department uh, was not a common thing back in the 1930s when Hathaway uh, joined um, the staff there. Uh, they began working on the MMPI uh, in the late 1930s, and their effort culminated in 1943 uh, with publication of the final version of the uh, uh, Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Their goal was to develop a differential diagnostic instrument, one that could be administered to any patient, new patient in the hospital, uh, and in a very direct uh, uh, way indicate on the basis of their scores uh, whether they had one or more of the eight most commonly occurring psychiatric disorders um, that uh, they uh, uh, treated at the time at the hospital. Uh, and uh, what they did, of course, was to assemble uh, eight groups of patients corresponding to those targeted disorders and um, uh, administer to those patient groups a pool of items uh, that they had um, uh, put together uh, and then contrasted the responses of each of the patient groups with a non-patient uh, group uh, that was also administered the same pool of items. The non-patient group was made up uh, primarily of um, friends and relatives of hospital patients who were approached in the hallways of uh, 
the University of Minnesota Hospital and asked to volunteer to participate in a research uh, study. Those who agreed were asked um, whether they were presently under the care of a physician or receiving any kind of mental health services. If they said no, they were deemed eligible for the normal uh, contrast uh, group. Um, and that was the sample that was then used to contrast uh, its responses with each of the patient groups to select items that the patients answered differently from the non-patients. The thinking was that if a new patient coming into the hospital answered many of the same items uh, as one of the patient groups in the same direction, uh, that that new patient likely also had the targeted diagnosis. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work. That, uh, didn't work. The, the test did not work as Hathaway and McKinley had uh, uh, intended uh, uh, it uh, to be used. Uh, the uh, uh, a number of people who produced clinically elevated, which was defined as more than two standard deviations above the mean score for the normal groups. They used the same sample that was used to develop the scales to also uh, develop the norms for the original MMPI. And uh, uh, many people who scored more than two standard deviations above the mean on a given scale did not actually have the targeted uh, diagnosis upon closer uh, inspection uh, by hospital uh, staff. Uh, so, for example, most people who scored above 70, T-score 70 on the schizophrenia scale did not have schizophrenia, and it was not possible to use the test as a direct uh, diagnostic indicator. Um, however, um, I think there was such a strong need for an omnibus measure of personality and psychopathology that clinicians, at least initially in the upper Midwest, began using the test uh, uh, with their patients. And they noticed that certain patterns of score, certain combinations of scores on the clinical scales tended to reoccur among uh, patients and that the patients who had those particular combinations of, of elevated scores had certain features in common, certain personality characteristics or symptoms of psychopathology or behavioral tendencies were more likely to be found uh, in one group of patients classified based on their pattern of scores versus another. Uh, and that led, uh, and, and the person who led this effort was Paul Meal, one of uh, Hathaway's uh, uh, graduate students at the time that the MMPI was being developed. Uh, and Meal and others led uh, the effort then to uh, uh, move the MMPI away from the original paradigm into a new uh, measure that was an empirically based classification, description, and prediction uh, system using the clinical scales to classify patients into what came to be known as code types, the codes referring to the um, uh, numeric codes that were assigned to each of the original uh, clinical uh, scales. Uh, in addition to the uh, clinical scales, the MMPI from the uh, get-go included validity scales that were used to uh, assess the uh, quality of the information provided by a given uh, test taker. Uh, supplementary measures uh, began to be uh, published in the literature uh, shortly after the MMPI was first introduced. Uh, and the norms, as I mentioned, were based on that uh, original sample of Minnesotans tested in the uh, late 30s and early 1940s. It was a very adequate normative sample for the original targeted uh, population, namely their friends and relatives who they were visiting uh, in the hospital. But obviously, as the test became more widely used uh, throughout the U.S. and with time, uh, that normative sample became increasingly inadequate. And that was the primary uh, motivation for developing the MMPI-2, uh, which was published in 1989. Uh, the MMPI-2 was developed by a committee led by Jim Butcher, along with Grant Dahlstrom, Jack Ram, and Alka Teligan. Uh, and uh, the uh, committee that was called the Restandardization uh, committee was uh, their work was coordinated by Beverly Kemmer of the University of Minnesota Press. Uh, their primary objectives were to collect the new nationally representative normative sample. This was done throughout the um, uh, 1980s or in the mid 1980s, I should say, and enhance content coverage by replacing some original MMPI items that were not scored on any of the basic validity and clinical scales with uh, new items that were written for the MMPI-2. So the norms were collected in the mid-1980s. The clinical scales were essentially left uh, intact, um, not because there weren't concerns already in the literature about the psychometric uh, adequacy of the clinical scales, but rather because the committee thought that updating both the norms and the scales at the same time would be uh, too disruptive, potentially, uh, and of the two, the need for new norms was deemed more uh, pressing uh, 
uh, new items uh, were included on the MMPI-2 uh, via a set of uh, content scales. Uh, some new validity scales were introduced in 1989 to complement the original MMPI uh, validity scales. Uh, there was some initial skepticism expressed by um, at least some uh, individuals who had uh, uh, had a lot of experience with the original MMPI who wondered whether the code types could be similarly interpreted on the uh, MMPI-2 with the impact of the new norms, uh, but those issues were relatively quickly resolved and, and the MMPI-2 was adopted for use by most original MMPI users within several years of its uh, release. Uh, the next important uh, milestone was in 2008, publication of the MMPI 2RF, uh, uh, co-authored by Al Koteligan, uh and myself. Um, and our uh, primary goals for the MMPI 2RF is listed here. Uh, the goal was to represent the clinically significant substance of the MMPI 2 item pool with a comprehensive set of psychometrically adequate measures. Basically what that uh, conveys is that uh, Telegon and I and many others believe that uh, the item pool of the MMPI-2 is a very rich source of clinically relevant information, uh, but the clinical scales uh, are not optimal, certainly, as far as their psychometric properties are concerned. And uh, what we wanted to do was to apply modern test construction techniques to the item pool to see if we couldn't um, improve the uh, psychometric functioning of the scales while continuing to rely on this rich uh, item pool. Uh, we believe that if we were to succeed, we would have a more efficient instrument, and we wound up using only 338 of the 567 items, so more efficient in terms of length, uh, but also uh, in terms of interpretation. Uh, we sought to enhance the construct validity of the test by linking the restructured scales of the MMPI 2RF uh, to current models and concepts in, in the field of personality and uh, psychopathology so that we can interpret scores on the scales, not only on the basis of their empirical correlates, but also an understanding of the uh, constructs that they uh, assess. Um, the, the strategy involved basically first restructuring the clinical scales, the RC scales were uh, introduced in 2003, and then augmenting the RC scales with all the measures that were needed to comprehensively assess what could be reliably and validly measured with the MMPI-2 uh, item pool. And again, we wound up using 338 of the um, uh, 567 MMPI-2 items. Two things we didn't do with the restructured form was to add any new items or collect new norms. We essentially used the MMPI-2 normative sample that was collected in the mid-1980s to standardize scores for the uh, MMPI-2RF. And this brings us to uh, uh, the here and now, uh, the MMPI-3, which was released in late uh, 2020 with uh, the two primary objectives being to update the test norms uh, and to enhance uh, the content coverage of the um, instrument. Uh, the need to uh, update the test norms uh, stems from the fact that the MMPI-2 slash MMPI-2RF norms are now 30 plus uh, years old. They were collected in a very different uh, time. Uh, the population that they're designed to represent has changed substantially both demographically uh, and experientially since the mid-1980s. Uh, uh, one way to um, illustrate uh, the latter uh, is that no member of the MMPI-2, MMPI-2RF uh, normative sample had ever heard of the internet, let alone uh, social media and uh, all of the changes, uh, societal changes that um, uh, have come with those uh, 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 developments. So what we sought to do was to build on the foundations of the MMPI-2RF, develop some new MMPI-3 scales to address uh, areas that are not adequately represented by the MMPI-2 and therefore also not by the MMPI-2RF uh, item pool, uh, enhance some of the MMPI-2RF scales, collect new norms both in English and for the first time in the U.S. for an MMPI instrument, uh, Spanish language norms. Um, and uh, throughout the process, we were uh, uh, very mindful of the importance of uh, uh, maintaining continuity between the MMPI 2RF and MMPI 3 scales so that it would be possible to apply the MMPI 2RF research literature when interpreting scores on the MMPI 3, and I'll return to that uh, later in the uh, presentation. So uh, the goals, uh, just to reiterate, uh, were to address needs that were not uh, uh, dealt with with the MMPI 2RF, 
updating the test norms and enhancing the content of the uh, instrument. We began with some preliminary studies. Uh, the first of these involved looking at the response format of the test to determine whether uh, to maintain the traditional true-false response format or switch to a gradated or sometimes called polytomous response format. We created a four-point response format version of the MMPI-2RF, administered it, um, and also the true-false response uh, version of the test to a sample of uh, undergraduates along with a battery of uh, criterion measures to see whether uh, we would be able to improve the validity of the MMPI-2RF scales uh, if scored on the basis of responses to a polytomous uh, format. Uh, and what we found was uh, uh, there was no difference. The, the uh, polytomous response format did not improve the validity of scale scores. So we decided to uh, uh, retain the traditional true-false response format. Uh, this was actually a study that was published in uh, 2014. Jacob Finn uh, of the Minneapolis VA now is the first uh, author of that uh, paper. If anyone's interested, if you send me an email, I'll be happy to send you a copy of that paper. Uh, the next thing we uh, sought to do was to look at the possibility of uh, improving some of the MMPI 2RF items, particularly ones that uh, had uh, somewhat awkward or dated uh, wording. Uh, there are a couple of examples here in the slide of uh, simplified items. I love to go to dances was modified to read, I love to go dancing, and I am apt to take <clears throat> excuse me, disappointment so keenly that I can't put them out of my mind was revised to read, I'm likely to feel disappointment so strongly that I can't uh, put them out of my mind. Um, so we made a number of changes uh, uh, like that, collected data to check and make sure that the changes didn't alter the psychometric functioning of the uh, revised items, found that in some instances uh, it did, so we reverted back to the previous wording, but uh, 43 of the 338 MMPI 2RF items were uh, simplified in this manner for the development of the MMPI 3. And then the final uh, preliminary uh, work that we did involved new item development uh, of candidate items for addition uh, to the MMPI 3. Our objective here was to identify content that was either missing or insufficiently represented by the MMPI 2RF um, item pool, we consulted with 12 experts, uh, both researchers and clinicians with a lot of experience with the MMPI 2RF. We took a look at existing uh, measures and um, developed a preliminary set of 135 trial items. Uh, some of them were just nuanced uh, differences and we didn't expect to use all of them. We collected some data to check and find out uh, which of the trial items uh, seemed most promising and wound up uh, retaining 95 uh, trial items as candidates for uh, inclusion on the uh, MMPI-3. Uh, with that preliminary work uh, having been done, we then uh, implemented a plan. Uh, the first and very important component of the plan was development of an expanded version of the MMPI-2RF called MMPI-2RF-EX, or just EX for short. Uh, the expanded booklet uh, began with a brief biographical questionnaire followed by the 338 MMPI 2RF items, including 43 of those that were uh, updated, as I just mentioned, and then uh, the 95 trial uh, items, so 433 items in all. Um, and uh, these were placed in a, in a booklet uh, and answer sheets were developed. But also importantly, uh, Pearson developed a separate standalone version of its QLocal uh, software for administering and scoring tests um, that uh, was used specifically for the development of the MMPI-3. And what this allowed us to do was to make this software available at our field data collection site so that they could administer the expanded booklet, score the MMPI-2RF, use it in actual applied assessments. Um, and then of course, along with the uh, uh, MMPI-2RF items, the trial items were also Administer. So this gave us access to uh, uh, data that field data that were used uh, in uh, the development and validation uh, work with the um, MMPI-3 with, from actual assessments, not just research uh, uh, assessments. Uh, in addition, all of the new material was translated into Spanish. Uh, so the starting point here was the Spanish translation of the MMPI-2RF by uh, Garcia and Azan. Uh, and then all of the rewritten uh, and, and, and the trial items, the 43 rewritten, rewritten items, the 95 
trial items were translated by a team led by uh, Dr. Uh, Antonio Puente of the University of uh, North Carolina in Wilmington. Uh, Tony uh, recruited a, a team of uh, Spanish speakers uh, of different ancestral origin to uh, help with the translation of these uh, items and materials, and that was part of the um, uh, development plan uh, as well. As far as data collection, we collected three types of data for the MMPI-3. Uh, the field data I already mentioned, these were data that were collected at sites representing settings in which the MMPI is used, including mental health, uh, medical, forensic, and public safety uh, settings. Uh, uh, different portions of the field data were used for scale development uh, and validation. We didn't, of course, use the same data for developing and validating the scales, and all of the field data were used uh, and are being used to uh, compose uh, comparison groups, something that we first introduced with the um, MMPI-2RF for those who are familiar uh, with that version of the test. Um, college student data were also uh, uh, collected. Uh, these data were collected at Kent State where uh, I'm on the faculty, but also at other uh, institutions where researchers collected their own data that they can now use for MMPI-3 uh, studies. Um, uh, the data collected at Kent were used for some of our initial psychometric analyses as part of the development process and also for detailed validation analyses that are reported in the technical uh, manual. One of the um, advantages of, uh, of uh, using college students for this kind of uh, research is that we're able to administer fairly comprehensive batteries of other measures in addition to the expanded booklet uh, to our college student um, participants. Um, and, and we selected instruments primarily focused on uh, those areas that we targeted for enhancement uh, uh, for the uh, MMPI-3. Uh, the uh, final uh, set of data that was uh, collected for the MMPI-3 were the normative uh, data collected in English and Spanish, and we also collected data from a bilingual uh, English-Spanish speaking uh, sample, and I'll describe shortly how we used uh, some of those data. In terms of numbers, uh, you can see here that a total of 16,600 individuals were uh, tested as part of the field uh, data collection. A large proportion, as you can see, were in public safety settings. That's because we were actually targeting uh, data collection for four different uh, occupations, public safety uh, candidates, uh, police officer, uh, correction officer, dispatcher, and firefighter uh, medic. And so uh, we collected data from all of those uh, 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 occupations. Uh, and then about 2,400 individuals tested in mental health settings, 2,000 in medical, 1,200 in forensic slash uh, correctional uh, settings, and 800 uh, disability uh, claimants. Uh, the college student data, about 8,000 uh, individuals were tested as part of that uh, data collection. And then for developing norms, we tested 2,382 individuals in English. 280 of those came back for uh, retest uh, purposes a week later. Uh, 664 were tested in Spanish with uh, 60 coming back for uh, retest. And then we had 45 individuals in our bilingual uh, sample. Altogether, approximately 28,000 protocols were collected for uh, the development and validation of the uh, MMPI-3. The development process itself is described in chapter two of the technical manual. I'll just give you some of the uh, uh, brief uh, uh, highlights here. Uh, so uh, using the field data, the first uh, set of scales that we turned to were the restructured uh, clinical scales, the RC scales. Um, although they're considerably shorter than the clinical scales, the original MMPI clinical scales, we were aware uh, from our own work uh, with these scales uh, that some of them could potentially be shortened without loss of reliability and validity. And that always was a, a determining uh, factor in making decisions about uh, the uh, visa, uh, feasibility of uh, uh, shortening uh, the RC scales. We did shorten some of them, also replace some of the existing items with some of the new uh, trial items on the RC scales. Uh, and then uh, some of the specific problem scales, the most narrowly focused scales on the test uh, were lengthened uh, and expanded in terms of their content uh, coverage. We then turned to the higher order and sci-5 uh, scales and made revisions to address uh, item deletions and additions to the RC and specific uh, problem scales. All of, again, all of these uh, decisions about item deletion and addition were based on empirical analyses with some of our field uh, data. Uh, and then we also updated uh, the validity scales. Uh, I'll describe that in a little bit more detail here uh, shortly. Uh, 
And then the final very important step in the development of the MMPI three scales was that we examined all of the rewritten and new items that had been selected for inclusion on the MMPI three to make sure that they functioned adequately in Spanish, not just in, in English. Uh, so we did that using the Spanish normative and the bilingual uh, samples. And, and uh, one of the items that we had uh, planned to include on the MMPI-3 did not function adequately in Spanish. And so that item was uh, dropped. The uh, uh, outcome of the development process includes uh, five new scales, one validity scale and four uh, specific uh, problem scales. Uh, the new validity scale is called Combined Response Inconsistency, CRIN. If anyone uh, here today is a user of the MMPI ARF, you're familiar with the CRIN scale uh, there. That's when we first introduced this uh, um, uh, superordinate inconsistency measure that basically combines, as the label implies, information from the VRIN and TRIN uh, scales that were updated for the MMPI-3 to give an overall indication of the uh, level of inconsistent responding in a a given protocol. And then we have uh, four specific problem scales. The labels are fairly self-explanatory. Eating concerns is made up of items uh, describing various problematic eating uh, behaviors, something that was never uh, in, in the past included on any version of the um, uh, MMPI. Uh, compulsivity focuses on uh, proclivity to engage in compulsive, repetitive uh, behaviors such as uh, checking and, and uh, so forth. Uh, impulsivity, of course, uh, uh, impulsive behavior, lack of control over um, uh, impulses, non-planful uh, behavior assessed with our new impulsivity scale. There were a small number of impulsivity-related items on the MMPI-2 and, and RF, uh, but uh, that was an area that was not adequately uh, canvassed, and, and so we've added some new items for the MMPI-3. And the same is true of the final scale here, self-importance, which focuses on on grandiosity, uh, uh, the not uh, sufficiently represented in the uh, MMPI-2, MMPI-2RF item pool. And so we wrote some items uh, and developed uh, the scale that we call uh, self-importance that taps into uh, grandiosity. Uh, some of the studies already uh, being published on this scale particularly link it to um, uh, grandiose features of narcissistic uh, personality uh, disorder. Uh, and so these are the, the new scales. Uh, several of the existing scales uh, underwent some fairly substantial modification, including the MMPI 2RF anxiety scale that was substantially expanded, now called anxiety related experiences. It went from five to 15 items, just to give you an idea. Uh, the stress and worry MMPI 2RF scale was divided into separate measures of stress uh, and worry, and then interpersonal passivity. Uh, that scale was reverse keyed for the MMPI-3, so it's now called dominance. Uh, high scores would then on this scale indicate that the person is prone to engage in uh, domineering, overbearing behavior, whereas low scores now on the reverse keyed scale would indicate passive submissive uh, behavior. This change was made uh, to facilitate uh, a reorganization of the externalizing and the interpersonal scales that I'll talk about here uh, shortly. And then finally, we did drop some scales to make room for some of the new uh, items. Gastrointestinal and head pain complaints were dropped, although some of the items were kept on the test and are scored on RC1 somatic complaints. Uh, multiple specific fears and the two interest scales were also dropped uh, to make room for new item content for the uh, MMPI-3. Uh, altogether, we wound up adding 72 of the 95 trial items, uh, deleting 75. MMPI 2RF items uh, leading to a total of 335 items on the um, uh, MMPI 3. Uh, and you can see here on this slide, uh, 220 of those, so about two thirds, um, uh, over two thirds uh, of the uh, MMPI 3 items are original MMPI uh, items. 47 of these have been revised either for the MMPI 2 or the MMPI-3, and then 43 of the MMPI-3 items were developed for the uh, MMPI-2, uh, and then of course the 72 uh, new MMPI-3 uh, items. Uh, the reading level for the MMPI-3 remains the same as the reading level of the MMPI-2RF. If you're using the Flesch-Kincaid readability uh, index, it's a grade 4.5 on that um, index. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that every item can be read at that level, and there is a, uh, 
table in the Manual for Administration Scoring and Interpretation that reports uh, the flesh Kincaid index for each of the 335 uh, MMPI-3 uh, items. Altogether, we have uh, 52 scales on the MMPI-3. We obviously don't have time in a one hour uh, presentation to go over uh, each of the scales, but just to give you a, a overall sense of the structure of the scales, we have uh, uh, 10 validity uh, scales, uh, the nine of which were carried over from the uh, MMPI 2RF to the MMPI 3, and then the 10th scale being the CRIN, the new combined response inconsistency scale. We read uh, calibrated the inconsistency scales using the MMPI 3. Uh, item pool and also the three and frequency scales using uh, new uh, uh, samples. The, the in frequency scale items that were selected for the MMPI 2RF were selected on the basis of samples that were collected in the 80s and 90s. So we used the new samples to recalibrate the three and frequency scales. The uh, two over reporting indicators that are not based on item response frequency, FBS and RBS, were carried over without change. Uh, to the MMPI-3, and then we also recalibrated the two underreporting scales. Uh, turning to the substantive scales of the MMPI-3, the scales that I'm circling now here on the screen are part of a three-tiered hierarchical structure, three levels of measurement, uh, the same as the ones that we have on the uh, MMPI-2RF. At the broadest level, we have our three higher order scales. The second tier of measurement is represented by eight restructured clinical or RC scales, and the most narrowly focused scales are the 26 uh, specific problem scales. These are not subscales, they're all sufficiently reliable and valid to stand um, on their own, uh, but they are uh, the most narrowly focused scales of the MMPI-3, and they're subdivided into four uh, sets, um, including seven externalizing and five interpersonal scales. I mentioned earlier that we did do some reorganization of these scales for the MMPI-3. This was based on some analyses that uh, were conducted by Martin uh, Selbaum, uh, who's done a lot of work, of course, with the test and has particular expertise in externalizing psychopathology. Uh, he wrote one of the appendixes of the technical manual to explain this uh, reorganization. Uh, part of the reorganization also include, included moving one of the RC scales, RC3, the cynicism scale is now uh, on the externalizing scale profile. So we that's why we have only eight versus nine RC scales on the uh, MMPI-3. And again, the details uh, uh, about this can be found in the, um, uh, in the technical uh, manual appendix uh, C. Um, in terms of the norms, the norms were collected by a market research firm uh, called Eureka Facts that is uh, headquartered in Washington, DC. The University of Minnesota Press issued a request for proposals and, and received several proposals. This company was selected because of their experience in uh, nationwide data collection and in particular uh, collecting data from hard to reach populations. They had a lot of experience collecting data uh, with individuals of Hispanic um, uh, origin, including Spanish speaking populations, which of course was an important part of the uh, normative data collection. The norms were collected uh, between September 2017 and December uh, 2018. Uh, and um, what they did was in the various locations where we were recruiting participants for the normative sample, uh, they put ads in uh, social media, uh, notices in social media, and newspapers, uh, did some word of mouth advertising, also some outreach, community outreach to uh, senior centers and, and GED uh, training uh, centers. Uh, we had given them a, a, a target, a grid of demographic uh, targets that I'll mention here shortly, and they screened thousands of individuals by phone and then invited over the three, the over 3,000 individuals to be tested in person. All of the testing that was done was done in pre-arranged uh, locations with uh, supervision and monitoring by Eureka Fax staff who we had trained for this uh, purpose. Each participant was paid $50. If they came back for a second test, they were paid another $50. About 98% were tested by computer, which allowed us to access the data in real time as they were being uh, collected. Uh, the final English language normative sample uh, was selected to approximate uh, 2020 census projections for uh, race, education, and age. In, in 2017, the US Census Bureau uh, published uh, projections for the adult US population on these and other demographic uh, variables, but these were the ones that we 
targeted and uh, worked with Eureka Facts to, um, uh, to recruit. Uh, the final sample is made up of 1,620 individuals, 810 men, 810 women, and the T-scores uh, for the MMPI-3, as was the case for the restructor form, are non-gender T-scores, meaning that they're based on the combined sample of 1,620 uh, individuals, although it's possible to compare a test taker's results with just the men or just the women of the normative sample via the um, uh, comparison uh, groups that we have available. Uh, these are the sites where the normative data were collected, Washington, D.C., and New York City representing the eastern uh, seaboard, Chicago and Minneapolis, the Midwest, uh, Seattle and San Diego, the West Coast, Dallas and Miami, the South and uh, Southeast. Uh, we did collect uh, data from individuals living in more rural communities uh, uh, near these uh, population centers, uh, but in order to make sure that we have a sufficient number of uh, individuals in the normative sam sample who lived in rural communities, we also uh, did a data collection in um, West Virginia. As far as the uh, uh, targets for our uh, normative sample and, and how well we were able to meet them demographically, this is a table uh, that uh, shows the uh, distribution of race and ethnicity uh, in the MMPI-3 normative sample uh, percentages compared to the projections for the adult population in 2020, and also compared with the MMPI-2 and MMPI-2RF normative sample. And what you see right away is that the 82% uh, white composition of the MMPI-2 slash RF normative sample is well in excess of the 62.5% projection for uh, 2020. It was consistent with the 1980 census, which was the target for the uh, uh, normative data collection for the MMPI-2. For the MMPI-3, we included 60.3% uh, white individuals in the normative sample, uh, so there's a little bit uh, a little bit lower. And of course, with the uh, trajectories as they are, this uh, certainly will um, uh, catch up uh, uh, fairly uh, soon. Uh, the primary, other primary difference, of course, is the proportion of individuals of Hispanic uh, origin. Uh, by the way, I'm using the term Hispanic because that's the term that the Census Bureau uh, uses. I know that other um, um, uh, authors use uh, Latinx uh, these days, but uh, what you see here is what we uh, used based on the Census Bureau. So projection for adult population, 16.8% in 2020, only 2.9% in the MMPI-2 slash MMPI-2RF normative sample. We have 14% in the uh, English language normative sample. Of course, some of the 16.8% cannot be tested in English because Spanish is their preferred language. And that's why we have uh, for the MMPI-3 separate Spanish language uh, norms. Uh, but um, uh, the 14% actually slightly overestimates the proportion of uh, uh, individuals of Hispanic origin who could be tested in English presently. And, and again, uh, with the trajectories being what they are, uh, this will come more into, uh, uh, into line. There's a more uh, a refined, I should mention, uh, analysis or more detailed perhaps analysis in Appendix B of the technical manual where we go into a lot more detail demographically and, and ancestral origin for the uh, MMPI-3 normative sample. In terms of uh, age targets, the only group where we did not meet our, our goal was for the 80 plus year olds. Um, uh, in spite of our efforts going into senior uh, centers, um, I think this to some extent reflects the fact that this is also a population that's less likely to be tested with the MMPI, even with a 335 item instrument. Uh, so the 5.1% the are not all going to be testable, um, uh, if you will. But we are planning, given the importance and growing uh, numbers of these individuals in the population, uh, to do some research specifically uh, looking at the utility of the test with the 80 plus year old uh, individuals in the um, uh, in the population. As far as uh, education is concerned, one of the concerns early on about the MMPI-2 uh, normative sample was that it was over representative of higher education levels and insufficiently representative of lower education levels. These are the projections for the 2020 census. You can see that we came pretty close, a little underrepresented are the less than high school and no GED portion of the population, but again, not all of these 11.1% of these in, uh, individuals are testable with the MMPI. So 8.6% probably is pretty close to representing the testable uh, proportion of the uh, individuals with less than uh, high school uh, education. Uh, 
Um, in terms of uh, uh, whether the norms have changed, obviously once we had the normative sample in place, we were very interested to see how it compares with the previous normative sample. To do that, we plotted the means and standard deviations, uh, plotted the means and report here, the means and standard deviations for the men and women of the new MMPI-3 normative sample using the MMPI-2RF scales and uh, norms. Of course, if the new normative sample scored the same as the previous one, all of these means would be equal to 50 and all the standard deviations would be equal to 10 to the extent that they're not. That represents differences between the two sets of norms. So you can see, for example, we have about a half a standard deviation above the previous mean for the new normative sample on F and on uh, L uh, uh, in, in, on the validity scales, uh, higher scores on um, RC1 in particular for the women and RC4 uh, for the uh, men, uh, higher scores for both gender. In fact, this is the highest mean score on the substantive scales, any scale actually, uh, for the new normative sample using the previous norms on the malaise scale. The population is more preoccupied uh, with health and complaints about uh, concerns about health. Remember these data were collected pre-pandemic. Um, uh, the other scores are, are pretty close to the mean for, for the two normative uh, samples. A little bit higher on disaffiliativeness for our new uh, normative uh, sample. And uh, this gender difference between uh, on the disconstraint scale is very consistent with what we see in uh, uh, many uh, of the samples that have been collected with the MMPI 2RF. So, um, I just noticed before coming on here that uh, I'm missing a slide. There's a summary slide that basically indicates that for the uh, uh, English language normative sample, we are going to see somewhat lower scores on some of the infrequency uh, scales and also on the somatization uh, scales. Uh, and uh, clearly these differences do necessitate and, and uh, justify uh, updating the, uh, the test norms. Uh, this is a summary of a comparison of the Spanish language, the new Spanish language and English language norms. Most of the T-scores for the two normative samples fall within five T-score points of uh, each other, but there are some noteworthy differences. L T-scores are about 10 points higher for the Spanish language normative sample. Of course, when we use the Spanish language norms, that's taken into account. Um, and you can see here that we also have somewhat lower scores, uh, uh, particularly for women on the externalizing scales, lower scores uh, 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 for uh, in the Spanish language sample on malaise and higher scores on behavior restricting fears. Uh, separate norms are definitely needed. And again, the Spanish language norms uh, account for any uh, differences between the two uh, normative samples. Okay, um, these are the manuals, the Manual for Administration Scoring and Interpretation. Um, on the left, uh, the technical manual uh, that includes a list of uh, uh, people who contributed either appendix material or, or data for uh, the technical uh, manual are also listed here uh, and, and their contributions are gratefully um, uh, acknowledged. Um, all the information you need uh, and guidance needed to administer score and interpret the MMPI-3 is in this manual for administration scoring and interpretation. It includes an exhaustive interpretive guidelines and some uh, case uh, illustrations. Uh, the data reported in the technical manual, uh, including validity scale findings in chapter three, showing that uh, there are correlations in the 0.95 and above range between the MMPI-2RF versus MMPI-3 versions of uh, the over-reporting and under-reporting uh, scales um, indicate that, that they're basically measuring the same uh, thing, um, uh, same threats to protocol validity. Uh, Appendix E of the technical manual includes uh, about 39,000 correlations comparing with correlations between MMPI scores and external criteria comparing the MMPI 2RF and MMPI 3 versions of, of the scales and showing that uh, the correlates are essentially the same, in some instances substantially higher uh, for those scales that were targeted for enhancement for the MMPI-3, all of which means that uh, findings reported in the MMPI-2RF uh, technical manual and, uh, and in the uh, peer-reviewed literature of the, on the MMPI-2RF that now has more than 500 uh, articles, including many collected in forensic uh, uh, settings and many forensically relevant uh, studies, all of which can be applied to the interpretation 
of scales that were carried over to the MMPI-3, which is the vast majority of the MMPI-2RF and MMPI-3 uh, scales. We are now seeing uh, new publications uh, on the MMPI-3 in the peer-reviewed literature, and uh, I'm sure with time, this literature will also continue to uh, grow and, and be applicable to forensic uh, uses of the um, instrument. So uh, turning to that, to forensic uh, applications of the MMPI-3, um, uh, some of you have heard me say this before when the MMPI-2RF came out, and it certainly is applicable uh, today with the MMPI-3, and that is that revised versions of psychological uh, tests uh, can pose some challenges, particularly to forensic users of the test, given the adversarial nature of forensic, um, uh, the forensic uh, system. Uh, the, uh, the, and, and these challenges uh, can be challenges at the level of admissibility of MMPI-3, in this case, based testimony, although that's relatively rare, but, but more common that there will be challenges um, in terms of weight of the evidence uh, that can come up in cross-examination, either in deposition or in, uh, uh, in, in trial uh, testimony. Um, and in some respects, when a new version of a psychological test is released, forensic examiners may find themselves in a situation where they're damned if they do and damned if, if you don't. If you use the new version of the test, you can be challenged for using a, a new unproven device. If you use a previous version, you can get challenged for using an old antiquated uh, device. Uh, could be the same attorney in two different cases give, uh, with, with different uh, interests of their clients uh, represented uh, making that challenge. There's only one way to completely avoid having to deal with this, and that's to never revise and update our tests. I think most people would find that an in, uh, unacceptable uh, solution. So the alternative is for forensic examiners to become familiar with the rationale for uh, methods used and, and, of course, outcomes of the revision, uh, and then make informed decisions about which version of the test uh, to, to use in your practice and be prepared to, to defend if there is a challenge uh, and justify your, uh, your, your, your choice of, uh, of instrument. Um, so in that context, I'll, I'll highlight uh, a number of advantages that you could uh, point to in the, uh, if, if challenged about using the um, uh, MMPI-3. Um, uh, for uh, MMP, those who are currently using the MMPI-2RF, the uh, most obvious advantage of transitioning to the MMPI-3 is the current population norms and representing the population, the adult population of the United States, something that is really not uh, 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 the case anymore with the uh, uh, normative sample for the MMPI-2 and MMPI-2RF. Of course, the updated scales, recalibrated validity scales, enhanced uh, substantive scales, the fact that the MMPI-2RF literature can be applied when using uh, the MMPI-3 and that the technical manual also includes extensive uh, validation data for the newly introduced uh, scales. Uh, for MMPI-2 users, um, the validity scales uh, of the MMPI-2 have some um, significant uh, shortcomings, quite a bit of item overlap that was addressed first when uh, moving to the MMPI-2RF. Uh, uh, um, uh, the validity, the infrequency scales of the MMPI-2 were, uh, uh, the, particularly the F scale itself, was not recalibrated in spite of the fact that some of the F scale items are no longer answered and frequently were no longer answered and frequently by the 1980s normative sample. And of course, the FS and RBS scales that are part of the uh, MMPI-3, but not part of the MMPI-2. Uh, the clinical scales increasingly are dated and have some very significant psychometric deficiencies. So this is not the time or, or forum for, for detailing these, but they have been discussed in, uh, in some detail in, in the literature. Um, uh, the, the primary concerns having to do with excessive intercorrelations among the clinical scales that significantly limit their discriminant validity and their heterogeneity that significantly limits their uh, convergent validity. The uh, MMPI-2 uh, users, another important uh, uh, advantage for moving to the MMPI-3 is that with the MMPI-2, uh, excuse me, with the MMPI-3, we focus on psychological constructs rather than elusive psychiatric uh, syndromes that uh, cannot be assessed really directly with single scales. Uh, and our, our MMPI-3 scales are learned to link to current models in the literature 
in personality and psychopathology, including uh, some of you may be familiar with the uh, high top, uh, the hierarchical taxonomy of psychopathology, and also the alternative model of personality uh, disorders uh, 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 in section three of the DSM-5. Both of these can be linked very clearly and directly to scales of the MMPI-3 and of course the uh, current uh, uh, population uh, norms. Uh, in terms of the um, uh, other uh, uh, advantages of MMPI-3 over other tests, non-MMPI uh, tests, what I would point to here uh, is a broad range of empirically uh, validated up-to-date uh, response bias indicators. Uh, the validity scales of the MMPI-3 have very strong uh, empirical uh, support, all of them. Um, the uh, very extensively validated substantive scales that again can be linked to modern uh, current models of uh, personality and psychopathology uh, in the literature, and of course, current uh, population uh, norms. Uh, uh, th there are no other uh, widely used uh, self-report inventories uh, with norms that uh, were collected uh, uh, very uh, recently. Uh, the, the, the main competitor, uh, of course, for the MMPI in this regard is the, the PAI. The norms for the PAI were collected around the same time as the MMPI-2 norms, so they're uh, 30 plus years old now um, uh, as well. So that's another uh, advantage you could point to if you're choosing to use the um, uh, MMPI-3. Uh, in terms of admissibility uh, issues that uh, might come up, um, I'm just gonna go through this very uh, quickly because we are running short on time. Uh, has the technique been uh, tested? These of course are the Daubert uh, criteria or factors, uh, obviously the answer is yes, there is an abundance of empirical data, including in the technical manual uh, and the peer reviewed literature on the MMPI 2RF can be applied to MMPI 3 uh, interpretation. Uh, error rate, uh, standard errors of measurement are reported in the MMPI 3 uh, technical manual uh, standards. Uh, controlling the techniques operation are outlined in the manual for administration scoring and interpretation. Uh, the final question, of course, is the old uh, Fry test of uh, uh, general acceptance. Um, if you uh, uh, accept the notion that the MMPI-3 is essentially a, a new edition of the MMPI-2RF and that uh, the, uh, the, the acceptance of the MMPI-2RF can apply to uh, the MMPI-3, given that the literature can be applied, um, I think that that, uh, of course, can also be uh, addressed in that manner uh, as well. Uh, so those are the um, uh, slides uh, that I wanted to go through. I wanted to make sure to leave some time here at the end for uh, questions. And uh, I see that Dr. Bravko is back with us. Thank you so much. Um, so the first question is, will the three be made available for paper administration? There is a paper and pencil version of the uh, MMPI-3 uh, and it can be administered using Pearson's two uh, software platforms, QLocal and, and QGlobal. Great. Um, what plans, if any, are in place to develop international versions of the three? Uh, this person saying there's great need, especially on the African continent. Um, so the, um, uh, there is already a French Canadian translation of the MMPI-3 uh, that's available uh, for use in, in Canada. It does not have separate norms, the MMPI tests have not been normed separately in French in, in, in Canada in, in the past. Hopefully that happens sometime uh, in the future. There are at least half a dozen um, translation projects that are underway. Uh, I'm not going to remember them all off the top of my head, but I know there's one in Japan, one in uh, South Korea, several in Europe. Unfortunately, not at this time uh, uh, any uh, work underway in, in Africa. I agree that that uh, is a underserved and much needed um, population for, for us to develop translations uh, for, and hopefully that's something we'll be uh, able to do in the relatively uh, not too distant future. Um, the next individual says there are three different Spanish language translations of the RF, uh, depending on region. Is the Spanish language version of the three for the US only, or is it appropriate for other countries as well? It's, it's the only uh, one developed specifically for use in, in the US. There is uh, uh, in Spain, uh, one of the three Spanish versions of the RF is in Spain and they're working on a new version of the MMPI-3. Uh, of course, this requires collecting new normative data. So it's gonna take a year or two before these are uh, 
um, available. The, the third Spanish version translation is in, in Mexico. There, there uh, I'm sure will eventually be a Mexican uh, translation of the um, MMPI-3. For now, I think it would be uh, uh, okay to try using the um, uh, Spanish language translation in, in the U.S. given that we have Spanish language norms. Uh, uh, in Mexico, but in the U.S., the the only version that that's recommended for use is the the, the standard so-called standard U.S. Uh, Spanish translation. Was the three evaluated with Canadian samples or only American? Um, there were some data collected in Canada. We're collecting some additional. We're developing additional comparison groups. There were about there are twenty comparison groups. Now for the MMPI-3, we're collecting some additional ones. Uh, the disability claimant sample is a Canadian uh, sample that was used in some of the development analyses and also is one of our uh, comparison groups. We have had- hey, Julie, uh, I'm just gonna make a quick comment to let everybody know that the um, evaluation link is in the chat. And if everybody rushes the website, it will crash. So you can just save it and try it later. It's um, good for 48 hours. So just save it and try it later. Thanks, Rachel. Um, this next individual says that in previous webinars that we've had, um, the topic of antisocial personality disorder diagnosis for forensic purposes has come up. Um, and when we've talked about those things, the issue of the overlap between the psychopathy checklist and MMPI um, has been approached. Any comments on this or can you elaborate on this at all? Well, there've been some, uh, some studies looking at the MMPI 2RF scores and their association with the, with the PCL. Uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that Martin Selbaum has done a lot of work in externalizing psychopathology and he's done some work in that uh, area uh, as well. Um, the, uh, the, unlike the PD scale of the MMPI-2, which was not strongly correlated with the non-behavioral components of the PCL, the, the, the uh, RC4 is, is uh, clinically significantly, if you will, correlated um, with, uh, meaningfully correlated with uh, both the uh, behavioral and the more affective interpersonal aspects of uh, psychopathy as represented by the psychopathy checklist. There's also a lot of research looking at associations between scores on the MMPI 2RF scales and other measures of psychopathy, including uh, Lilienfeld's uh, psychopathy uh, checklist, I mean, uh, uh, self-report uh, inventory and some other uh, measures uh, uh, as well. Uh, so, and again, uh, the, the data indicate that that, that that research will apply to the um, uh, MMPI-3 can be applied to the MMPI-3 as well. Okay. Um, any analysis of computer administered threes versus paper and pencil? Um, we haven't done uh, a new study with the MMPI-3. There have been studies done for many years, beginning with the original MMPI and later with the MMPI-2 and the MMPI-2RF showing that you get comparable results with computer versus paper and pencil uh, administration. With the RF, there even was a study showing that you get comparable results, whether you're using a, a laptop or a tablet. Um, I, I think there's a sufficient body of research showing that the mode of administration really doesn't impact the scores that uh, I don't think that we necessarily need to repeat that with the um, uh, with the MMPI-3. The one question that I think, uh, uh, that, that's not the question that was asked, but that I think would be very relevant here is that given that we used a 433 expan item expanded version of the MMPI-2RF uh, to collect the data that were used to develop and validate the MMPI-3, can we assume that those data will also apply to just the 335 item MMPI-3? And we actually did have collected data for that uh, that paper, uh, first authored by Jordan Hall, is, is published online at assessment, uh, showing that indeed, uh, whether you uh, score the MMPI-3 from the expanded booklet or the uh, eventual MMPI-3 booklet, you get essentially the same results with comparable validity. This next individual says both the MMPI-2 and RF met with some resistance when released. 
Uh, given that the research findings from the RF scales can be applied to the same scales on the three, um, this individual would anticipate less resistance to the three. And they'd like to know if that's been your experience. Um, I think that's, an, uh, I would agree with that expectation, but I, I certainly am aware that, that not everyone is thrilled with the MMPI-3, many of the people that, that didn't care for the MMPI-2RF um, and, and in general were, were not supportive of efforts to modernize the MMPI are, are not gonna be uh, happy with the um, uh, MMPI-3. But in terms of uh, uh, you know, research-based uh, concerns, uh, I, I don't think that, that there uh, are going to be any uh, problems for, for users uh, who wish to use the MMPI-3. There's a strong empirical uh, research base, and as the uh, individual indicated in their question, given that we can apply the 500 plus peer reviewed MMPI 2RF publications to the MMPI 3, that should alleviate uh, uh, most of those concerns. Um, so, for everyone that needs to jump off, it is past the hour. So, um, the didactic is officially over. We are going to stay on and answer more questions. I am seeing your comments that some of you are getting a survey not active um, notice. Just hang out for a few minutes, save this link, try in an hour or so. Um, you know, Rachel, Rachel knows what's going on. I promise you, you will be able to fill this out. And if you're still having issues uh, tomorrow or the next day, shoot us an email. Um, okay, so the next question is, um, or yeah, can you comment on the validity of remote administration? Yeah, so obviously, uh, when the pandemic uh, hit us last March, um, we uh, needed to make it possible for users of the MMPI to do remote administration, something that was not part of the uh, 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 use of standard use of the test prior to that. Uh, Pearson's Q Global platform does allow for remote administration. It had just never been enabled for the uh, MMPI instruments, but it was enabled uh, uh, to allow for remote administration. They call it remote on-screen administration or ROSA uh, with their Q Global uh, platform. Um, when when uh, that was done, uh, David Corey and I developed some uh, guidance for uh, remote administration of the MMPI instruments. Uh, and, and this guidance was published in uh, the journal Professional Psychology last uh, June. Uh, if anyone would like a copy, if you shoot me an email, I'm happy to send you uh, a copy of that article. Um, and it, it provides very detailed guidance. Uh, the most important thing, and, and this would be absolutely critical for forensic applications, but in our mind for any remote administration of the MMPI is that the administration be supervised remotely. Um, and that can be um, uh, done uh, via uh, camera uh, and, and, and should be done via camera with, with the person taking the test uh, being observed. It doesn't have to be done by the psychologist or uh, the clinician. Uh, it can be a technician or a psychometrist or someone trained by them and, and working under their authority. But, but the, uh, the testing should not be done without um, uh, supervision for the purpose of, uh, of course, maintaining test uh, security, but also in the case of uh, forensic uh, use of the test uh, chain of custody uh, and being able to testify that indeed these are the results for this particular um, uh, individual uh, supervision is critical. Thank you. Um, any comments about the use of MMPI-3 in custody evaluations? Um, for the MMPI 2RF, we had a comparison group of child custody litigants. We do not have such a comparison group at this point for the MMPI 3. We're actually collecting data uh, for a child custody litigant uh, comparison group. If anyone here is interested in uh, uh, participating in that, let me know and I can provide some details about that. Um, but um, again, to the extent that comparison groups are provide complementary information, they're not uh, uh, absolutely necessary for, for doing an, uh, an assessment with any version um, of the MMPI. So to the extent that uh, the issues that are pertinent in a child custody evaluation as far as the functioning of the parents, psychological functioning of the parents uh, uh, is concerned, certainly the MMPI-3 uh, substantive scales can address that. And if there are concerns about the possible impact of underreporting, which uh, 
certainly uh, can and does occur in child custody. Uh, evaluations obviously are underreporting scale to provide some objective uh, data on uh, on whether and to what extent a, a evaluee is engaging in underreporting. And there's research showing that that kind of underreporting can generalize to other aspects of the assessment, not just to the um, MMPI. So I think the MMPI really can provide uh, useful information in that uh, type of assessment. This next individual works as a psychometrician at a forensic hospital, and they ordered the MMPI-3, but have hesitated um, using it because of the lack of inpatient forensic norms and their concerns with it being questioned in court. Um, what advice would you have for this versus continuing to use the RF until there are forensic inpatient norms for the three? Well, we, we, we don't have forensic inpatient norms for the RF. Uh, there are studies looking at uh, forensic inpatients with the MMPI to RF, but uh, not norms in the sense of a formal comparison group. And as I just mentioned, I don't think a comparison group is is, is needed in order to, uh, to use the MMPI-3 with any uh, population. Um, in the case of forensic inpatients, where often uh, the issues, or some of the issues at least, have to do with thought dysfunction. Uh, thought dysfunction doesn't manifest itself differently on the MMPI uh, in forensic inpatients than in other uh, uh, populations. And, and we do have good validation data for our uh, measures of thought dysfunction on the uh, MMPI-3 and, and previously uh, the MMPI-2RF. Uh, having said that, uh, there are data, uh, there is a data collection project ongoing at a large forensic inpatient, actually two of them, one in California, one in, in Michigan. Um, and uh, I'm sure these will be, uh, some publications will begin to appear in the literature in the not too uh, distant uh, future. So if, if, uh, if that individual or that uh, facility prefers to wait until those data are, are published, uh, the MMPI 2RF certainly uh, remains an option. Is there a way to derive some of the supplementary scales from the MMPI 2 from the surviving items on the 3? This person's particularly interested in the OH scale. Uh, no, the, the, the short uh, answer is no. Um, the OH scale is one that I would particularly, now not that it can be done from the MMPI-3, but I don't recommend using it with the MMPI-2 either. It's a very problematic uh, scale, uh, and uh, 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 I, I've seen it misused many times. So that, uh, the over-controlled hostility scale is definitely not one that uh, I would recommend using on, on any version of the MMPI. What are the key findings in brief form that you would cite to say the MMPI-2 RF research or other MMPI research is applicable to the three? So I mentioned previously that in chapter three of the technical manual, there are correlations reported between uh, the validity scales of the two versions of the instrument. And for the over-reporting and, and under-reporting scales, those correlations are in the point 0.95 and above uh, range. And then in the Appendix E of the technical manual, uh, there's some 38,000 correlations comparing the external correlates of the RF versus MMPI-3 versions of the scales. And uh, those correlations are either very comparable or in some cases substantially higher for the MMPI-3, particularly for those uh, scales. These are correlations with external relevant external criteria particularly for those scales that were targeted for enhancement on the um, MMPI-3. Thank you. Um, do the two and three point code interpretations remain the same for the three as for previous versions? No, we do not use code types on the uh, MMPI-3. We didn't on the MMPI-2RF. The code types really were a, an ad hoc solution, uh, as I mentioned in the first part of the presentation. Uh, after the clinical scales didn't work, the code types were kind of a, a, a fix, uh, if you will. Um, but they also represent, code types represent a categorical measurement model that does not readily accommodate uh, comorbidity. Um, and so the, um, uh, the solution that we came up with for the MMPI-2RF was to develop dimensional measures that uh, can be used to 
uh, assess the same constructs, but but do so uh, from a dimensional perspective that does more readily accommodate uh, uh, comorbidity, something that uh, has uh, traditionally been uh, a challenge with the, uh, the co-types. But the co-type literature does not apply to the uh, MMPI-3. This next individual would like to know what your opinion is of why personality tests, including the MMPI, don't have confidence intervals around obtained scores as many intellectual and cognitive tests do. You know, I think they're, uh, it, it's really just uh, uh, two different uh, assessment uh, traditions, uh, uh, if you will. Uh, confidence intervals can be very readily calculated. We include in the uh, uh, technical manual standard errors of measurement for uh, all 52 scales. Um, and uh, given that and, and the information about the reliability of the scale scores, uh, it's certainly possible to, uh, to calculate uh, uh, confidence intervals. I, I think it's uh, more, uh, uh, the tradition is more to just interpret scores that are substantially deviant from the, the mean. So a T-score of 65 uh, corresponds to the 92nd uh, percentile. Uh, and so by, by interpreting uh, substantially deviating scores, it, it essentially gets at the same um, uh, principle that we, uh, when we uh, use confidence intervals to make sure that scores are, we're not interpreting different scores that really are not different beyond the level of measurement error. Can you talk a little bit about how psychiatric symptoms differ from psychological constructs and how that applies to psychological diagnostics, especially in the medical community? So I, I, I think that psychological symptoms are psychological constructs. Uh, the, 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 or psychiatric symptoms are psychological constructs. Depression is a, is a, is a construct. Uh, anhedonia uh, uh, is a, uh, a construct. Uh, dysphoria is a, uh, is a construct. Um, the, the real difference and the one that I was alluding to in my comments uh, what is the difference between psychiatric syndromes and psychological constructs? Psychiatric syndromes, uh, such as the diagnostic uh, uh, syndromes of, of the DSM, are made up of combinations uh, of, uh, of, of symptoms or behavioral uh, tendencies or personality uh, characteristics. And it's that combination and, and trying to target these complex uh, syndromal combinations with single scales that, that failed uh, in the early days of the MMPI and really um, uh, does so today. And, and so the high top model is a good example of a diagnostic model that uh, uh, sets aside the complex syndromes and focuses on, on, on psychological constructs or, or symptoms uh, from a dimensional uh, perspective as does the um, MMPI-3. Do you know off the top of your head of any citation that talks about defensive response style on the MMPI being indicative of generalized defensive responding? Um, there's nothing on the with the three as of yet, but there are some studies using the MMPI 2RF and before that, the MMPI 2 showing that the individuals who produce elevated scores on the underreporting scales of the MMPI underreport when they're administered other measures. So for example, the Beck depression inventory doesn't have uh, uh, validity scales, but if you administer the Beck along with the MMPI and there's evidence of underreporting on the MMPI, this research shows that, that the, those individuals also underreport on the Beck or other um, uh, measures that are administered. Um, and, and I think there, it would be very reasonable to infer from that that uh, uh, when people are assessed individual or uh, interviewed in those contexts, they also would more, be more likely to, uh, uh, to under-report. All right, final um, question for today. We're 15 past. Um, do you anticipate there being any supplemental materials or an essentials book or um, a book available for teaching the three coming out soon? Uh, yes, um, uh, we're updating the, the, so there's a book on the MMPI 2RF that I authored called Interpreting the MMPI 2RF. We're updating that book. Martin Selbaum is joining me as a co-author. Uh, uh, we're, we're close to being done with, with the book and we expect it to be released uh, uh, early next year. Uh, 
uh, I'm sure there will be an essentials uh, uh, book uh, as there was for the, um, uh, for the RF. Um, I think APA had a, a, a book. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure there will be additional books, but, but uh, our textbook for the MMPI-3 is scheduled for release in about uh, um, a year from now. And, and again, until then, all the information needed to uh, uh, interpret the MMPI-3 can be found in the Manual for Administration Scoring and Interpretation. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was fantastic. Um, a lot of people have written in and said that they definitely um, enjoyed this hour. So we, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you all for attending. Of course. Thank you. And I just want to remind everybody that the link, grab the link in the chat. Um, it is working. If you're still having issues, you might just want to try a new browser or refresh your browser, um, but it will be working and it's good for 48 hours. So thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next week.